Pete Davidson's NDA is likely unenforceable, but you shouldn't sign it anyway. Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today we have an interesting story, one that I wasn't expecting to see this morning. And that is that Pete Davidson, who you might recognize as Ariana Grande's former boyfriend, uh, sometimes Saturday Night Live guest, is putting on a tour of comedy shows. And apparently it came out over the weekend that as part of this comedy show tour, he is asking his guests to sign non-disclosure agreements and more. We're going to talk about the actual details here because fortunately we have one of his prospective guests actually putting up the contract on Facebook so we can dive into the details. And it's not a very long agreement, but he's asking his guests at his shows to sign this agreement with a liquidated damages provision of $1 million. Now, of course, the entertainment weeklies of the world and various other internet websites took this and ran with it because it's so funny. Uh, not that Pete Davidson himself is so funny in his shows, but at least the concept of this NDA is funny. And so they put all these headlines up. I will tell you there are conspiracy theorists out there that suggest that Mr. Davidson did this for this kind of publicity. And I can't actually tell you that those folks are wrong. This is the kind of thing that will get publicity in the year 2019. So it's a possibility that his PR people came up with this plan. I don't think it's specifically very likely if the details in these stories are correct, because this contract has been out there for much longer than just this past weekend. But let's take a look at this story. I've also got an AV Club story to just kind of give a little bit more highlights. Then we're going to dive into the contract itself, talk about the terms there, talk about how it's actually more than a non-disclosure agreement and why it is so likely to be, if not completely unenforceable, very difficult to enforce in various jurisdictions, especially in the United States. So here's the headline from Entertainment Weekly. Pete Davidson fans say they had to sign a $1 million NDA before the comedy show. Fans of Saturday Night Live star Pete Davidson may have a lengthy document to sign before catching one of his comedy shows. Now, Entertainment Weekly and I have to talk about what a lengthy, a lengthy legal document is, but that's another, it's another virtual legality episode. One such fan posted a non-disclosure agreement she says was sent to her via email before a recent San Francisco appearance. And they go over that. We're going to go over that in detail. It said Davidson's representatives did not immediately re- respond to EW's request for comment. Fans who attend the Bay Area performance have said the show was being taped for the star's Netflix comedy special, making the NDA standard protocol. But various audience members attending other shows in November are claiming they also had to sign a similar contract. So there is some detail here that is up for debate, right? If he is taping a Netflix comedy show, you would have probably standard provisions in place. You'd confiscate the phones and the beepers or whatever else anybody might have to communicate with. And you would also have them sign certain non-disclosure requirements because this is going to be his product. This is what he's selling to Netflix. And both he and Netflix have an interest in keeping it kind of protected. But as Entertainment Weekly points out, you have other people saying that they've had to sign this contract as well. And even if that isn't the case, it's too good of a story to pass up, right? Well, continuing on with the AV Club's take on this, they said, hey, jamming signals are requiring everyone to lock their phones in little bags to prevent them from leaking details about your comedy show is totally played out. Luckily, occasional Saturday Night Live cast member Pete Davidson has landed on a much more thorough solution, requiring prospective audience members to sign $1 million non-disclosure agreements to bar them from talking about anything that happens on stage on any platform, including social media. Now, AV Club actually winds up tying this to some issues that Mr. Davidson had with a few shows, I believe on a college campus where he got called out and a couple of videos about that show went viral and that maybe this is a response to that happening. And certainly if you are familiar with the internet at all, but more specifically with comedy folks on the internet, you have heard whispers and rumblings of various people getting agitated about either joke stealing, which has been around for a long time, or the response from audiences for non-politically correct jokes, as these comedians might frame them, or other things that they think are problematic amongst their audience members. So it's no surprise that if you are going to be at least mildly edgy, and I don't know Pete Davidson's comedy from anybody's, if you are going to be at least mildly edgy, maybe these comedians need to start taking a look at what protections they have in place for themselves. But there are ways to do that, and there are ways to go too far. So 
let's take a look at how Mr. Davidson has gone too far. So this comes courtesy of a Facebook user named Stacy Young as of November 27th, uh, the evening of, and she says, I got an email today informing me that in order to see this show, I have to sign a non-disclosure agreement. In that NDA, the signer cannot give any interviews, opinions, or critiques about it in any form whatsoever, including blogs, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or any other social networking. It also authorizes them to confiscate any cell phones, cameras, or PDAs, and that any breach of the agreement will require payment of a million dollars in damages. She says, hey, I understood about the phones and everything else, but why would you present your show in public if you don't want people to have an opinion on it? And I think she's got a point there. And certainly the courts would suggest that there are points to be made here. As we will talk about, the courts don't love NDAs. They don't love non-disparagement provisions. They don't love non-competition provisions. That doesn't mean they won't enforce them. So if you take nothing else from this video, know that when we are talking about these things, a lot of jurisdictions in the United States have a general desire to enforce contracts, that a lot of the precepts of American jurisprudence in the contract field is related to enforcing what words people agree to and what they sign their name to. But on top of that, in many jurisdictions, in most jurisdictions in the country, there's this kind of equitable principle that a contract can be so problematic in nature that it needs to be voided or at least limited in scope by the court for reasons of public policy. And I think when you get into the details here, as we are about to do, you will see that a court in the United States is very likely to, at bare minimum, limit this substantially, but in all likelihood, really, honestly, throw it out. That an audience member at a comedy show doesn't have a fiduciary relationship like an employee might have to an employer, isn't getting a standard benefit that might otherwise result in their signing this and it being deemed enforceable by the courts. And instead, this is a kind of preemptive action, either for publicity, as we discussed earlier, or because this gentleman, Mr. Davidson, is so concerned about joke stealing or about what happened to him in his previous video that he went overboard. But the court can look at this and say, all right, well, this is too much. They don't have a lot of this information. Maybe you can protect X, Y, and Z, but you can't do it in this fashion. And a million dollars, really? And we can have that conversation. But let's look at this what EW calls lengthy uh, legal document, even though it's one page long, and discuss the actual terms herein. Confidentiality and non-disclosure agreement. Now, the first thing I would note, and we will get into the details and the substance of this contract, is that it also probably should be titled non-disparagement or something along those lines, because this actually tries to attach to discussions that aren't otherwise confidential. And that's going to be one of its primary issues, is that, yes, the courts are generally okay with someone having a proprietary right in something, potentially like a joke, and saying, hey, you can't copy that. And if I'm really concerned about it, I can make you sign a contract to that effect. But this goes further than that, and that should be highlighted at the top. Now, they do do that in the box here, where they say, in short, by signing this agreement, you are agreeing not to discuss any details of the show you are about to watch or your experiences at this event, period. This includes blogs, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and any all other social media or online outlets. You can't say anything. Technically, I'm not sure that Miss Adams uh, on Facebook or Miss Young was able to say, hey, I was going to attend this show, especially if she signed the document, although it's unclear whether or not she did. Continuing with this, this confidentiality and non-disclosure agreement is made and entered into by and between Cowardly Dog, Inc., which we have to presume for this purpose is Pete Davidson's company, which I think is an apt name for it. This is a fairly cowardly approach to these kinds of issues. And or its affiliated or related companies and clients. And the signee at the bottom of this agreement known as the individual. For good and adequate consideration, the receipt, adequacy, and sufficiency of which are hereby acknowledged. Individual hereby agrees as follows. So there's a couple things going on there just in terms of legal documentation, right? So you've got the two parties. You've got Cowardly Dog, Inc., which presumably includes Pete Davidson as client or affiliate to the company. And the signee is going to be called Capital I Individual. And then they have a recitation of consideration because under the law, you can't have a contract unless each side gets consideration for what's happening here. 
Now, I don't know that there is adequate consideration. That's its own open question, right? The consideration for the initial contract is I pay you $40 or I pay you $400. I don't know how much a ticket for his show goes. And then I get access to your show. That's a contract. You've given me that access. You've sold that seat. I've paid you that money. That's the contract. Now you get in front of the show and say, oh, by the way, you have to sign this non-disclosure agreement. I think somebody could go into court and say, hey, yeah, I signed it, but I didn't get anything extra that I wouldn't have gotten from my $400. So judge, you should throw this out for lack of consideration. Just reciting it doesn't make it so, although it does give them a bit of a defense in front of that same judge. They said, hey, if there wasn't adequate consideration here, why did they sign this document? It then continues. Individual is or will be a guest of company at a performance event for the purpose of viewing works in progress creative content that may be associated with live or television programming and other media. In the course of individuals viewing of the creative content, capital C's, individual will acquire or may be exposed to information, including without limitation information that is written, oral, performed live, photographed or recorded on film tape or otherwise, as well as any as yet unreleased creative content. Individual agrees that he or she shall not, during the term of this agreement or thereafter, in perpetuity, disclose or cause to be disclosed or confirm or deny the veracity of to any third party or user authorize any third party to use. A lot of legal language there, right? But we can break that down. This basically says, hey, you know, this person is on Saturday Night Live, is in various movies or is scheduled to be in various movies, and may be working on material that they intend to sell or are working on in respect of their employment with, say, Saturday Night Live. So if you see this, you can't use it. You can't steal it. You can't tell anybody the joke because that is our client's creative content. To some extent, and I think even Stacey Young or the other people that are reporting on this, that makes sense. That this is, to whatever extent it's funny and useful and valuable, Pete Davidson's asset. He's been working on, he's created. He wants to put it out there essentially for a test audience. And much like you might sign a non-disclosure agreement and you might put your phones in baggies and everything else, if you're at an early test screening of say, the new Star Wars movie, this is a normal kind of set of events that you say, okay, I can't talk about what I saw. That's a normal NDA. And what you're not allowed to do, what this actually specifically references, is any information relating to the creative content, including jokes, stories, references, characters, plots, settings, or other elements, the business or interests of the company or company's affiliates, unless and until company or company's affiliates reveal the same to the general public. So the jokes are confidential. I don't know how you would gain access to the business prospects of Cowardly Dog Inc. at this show, but presuming that you would, you can't disclose that in each case until it's made public. So if you go and you watch this Pete Davidson show and he sets up a joke and then he puts it on Saturday Night Live later in the season, at that point in time, you can share it. That's normal for a confidentiality agreement. Any information developed by, performed or disclosed to individual by company, company's affiliates, or by any third party during the performance, unless revealed to the general public. Same kind of deal. Any information that company or its affiliates instruct individual not to disclose or confirm. The information described in one through three is here and after referred to collectively as the confidential information. Now, three is a little bit interesting, right? You don't actually have a tie bar there to it actually being confidential. So you can imagine a situation where Pete Davidson says Washington, D.C. is the capital of the United States and then says pursuant to Section three of the nondisclosure agreement that you signed, you are instructed not to disclose or confirm that fact if asked. So you can see that there's an issue with that language. And this is the kind of thing that a court would look at and say, well, that's overbroad drafting. Now I have to put on my overbreadth hat and really start to redline this document if I'm so inclined, or I just toss it out entirely. And it's subsections like that, which give me the red flag and say, well, okay, either lawyers were being instructed by their client to be overbroad on this, or it's not a fully legal document, or they just don't care whether it gets kicked out. And this is mostly a preemptive action because there are still a lot of well-meaning folks in the United States, well-intentioned folks that have no desire to breach a contract or violate the law. And when they sign their name to something, their word is their bond, regardless of its enforceability. That is still useful, especially to, uh, let's say, not so well-meaning individuals or companies that want to put these documents or provisions in place. They do have the effect of preventing people from taking actions that they otherwise might take that are fully legal. And that's some of the reason that these kinds of contracts exist. Continuing, 
individual acknowledges that maintaining complete privacy and avoiding disclosure of confidential information are critically important to company and its affiliates and business partners. That individual would not be given access to the confidential information if individual were not willing to agree to these terms and protect and preserve that privacy and confidentiality. And that individual's full and strict compliance with this agreement is a fundamental inducement upon which company is specifically relying and allowing individual to view, hear, or learn of the creative content. This is again going back to that kind of consideration question. They're now trying to establish, hey, we never would have sold you a ticket if you weren't willing to sign this document, even though presumably that wasn't made clear at the point of sale. They're now trying to essentially retrofit this consideration onto the sale. Confidential information is and shall remain the sole and exclusive property of company and its affiliates. And during and after the term of this agreement, confidential information, even when revealed to the individual, shall be deemed to remain at all times in the sole possession and control of the company and its affiliates. In other words, you get to see this stuff. You don't suddenly own it just by learning of its existence. Again, we're good so far, give or take. You know, subsection three is a little bit problematic, but we overall understand the thrust. Hey, maybe you're taping this for Netflix. Maybe you're working on stuff for SNL. And we understand that we can't take that, that that is your intellectual property. I think basically we're okay right now, but let's continue. Without limiting any other provision hereof, individuals shall not give any interviews, offer any opinions or critiques, or otherwise participate by any means or in any form whatsoever, including but not limited to blogs, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, or any other social networking or other websites, whether now existing or hereafter created, in the disclosure of any confidential information or any other information relating to this agreement, the creative content, the performance, or the business of company or its affiliates. Here's where we really start getting into issues. Much like subsection three above, this incorporates concepts that are not confidential. I think we can all agree at least in some respects, that if you go to a show in a kind of test screening environment and they're working on creative content, regardless of whether this is true or not, we will assume for this purpose that it is, that you don't own those things and that there is some value in you not disclosing the actual jokes or the punchline or things of that nature. But when you start getting into, you can't offer an opinion, you can't go on Twitter and say, Hey, I saw the latest Pete Davidson show, thought he had some good stuff in there. It dragged in the middle, but I really like how he finished it up. You can't say that according to A. And that's not confidential information, right? They they have no business reason to prevent you from saying that. They don't protect their jokes. They don't protect their stories. They don't protect their intellectual property. What they could potentially be protecting is the fact that a lot of people won't like the show. And if they go out with that and give their legitimate opinion, that that could hurt their business, that that could hurt their brand. But in general, that's going to be seen by a lot of courts, by a lot of judges as overbroad. Yes, absolutely. You can protect the intellectual property that you spent time and resources and money developing, but you can't prevent people from going and saying something about how they felt about the show or how they felt about the parking at the show or how they were treated by the ushers or anything else. And if you go that far, just like subsection three above, you, you're going to have a court that is going to look at this much more closely and say, well, that's really, really cutting it thin on whether or not you are infringing on people's just general authority to talk about their experiences. And should this be a contract that the courts, which of course have the power of state power, should enforce? And I think that's an open question when you look at something like this. If individual is contacted by a journalist, a representative of the media, or other third party who requests that individual disclose or confirm or deny the veracity of any of the information covered by this agreement, individual shall reject said request and or issue a no comment, and individual shall immediately advise company thereof. Now, again, this goes too far primarily because of the fact that they have limited your ability to give interviews or offer any opinions. There is a way to draft this while still broad and potentially something that you wouldn't want to sign going into a comedy show. There is a way to draft this that is much more clear in its intent. And I think was probably the precedent that this was based on where you have a version of this agreement where you say, hey, okay, so you've got this confidential information, one, two, and three, and three obviously goes too far, but let's just say that it didn't. You've got one, two, and three. And then what paragraph A could say here is it could say, hey, You can't give an interview where you disclose confidential information. You can't offer an opinion 
where you disclose confidential information. If somebody comes and asks you about something that would be confidential information, you can't answer that question. And that's very close to what this says, but it doesn't say that. Where you get that last piece that says, hey, you can't otherwise participate by any means or in any form whatsoever in the disclosure of any confidential information. That's the closest we get to that tie bar, right? That, hey, when we're talking about blogs and Twitter and Facebook, you can't disclose confidential information. However, they then broaden it or say, or any other information relating to this agreement, which has to be taken to include the overall bucket of opinions or critiques. So overall, if you limit the first sentence of this paragraph A, you get out from under a lot of this overbreath and a lot of these problems, but they didn't do that. They instead wanted to say, hey, you can't say anything about anything. You can't give interviews to journalists. You can't otherwise have an opinion or critique on the show. They were so meaningful in that interpretation of this paragraph, they actually shortened it and put it in a box up at the top of the document. And that's what's ultimately going to wind up getting this kind of thing kicked out of court is that it's so overbroad. It doesn't protect the intellectual property. And you went so far as to tell people how to behave when contacted by a journalist. That isn't normal. That isn't standard for a contract of this type. Continuing with paragraph B, the individual hereby agrees that companies shall have the right to confiscate, including seize and destroy the contents of cell phones, cameras, PDAs, and any and all other infringing devices usably brought into the screening without company's authorization and take all necessary measures to protect its rights. Again, I'm kind of with Stacey Young here. This is pretty normal. If they tell you you can't bring in a phone and you bring in a phone and they find it, the only real way to be sure that you don't have infringing information is for them to take it and look at it, potentially get your password from you and or destroy it. So that's pretty normal. This is the kind of term that you would see in a Disney early screening. I have attended those. I have signed NDAs of this type. But paragraph A is what's so unusual. And then, of course, paragraph C. Individual agrees that any breach of this agreement will cause company and its affiliates and business partners incalculable damages. Such damages include all costs of any nature associated with the creative content, presumably the development of it, as well as the incalculable creative efforts and management time necessary in creating and distributing the same, the costs of putting on this tour. Accordingly, individual agrees that in the event of breach of this agreement, individuals shall pay company upon demand as liquidated damages, the sum of $1 million plus any actual out-of-pocket expense, as well as attorney fees expended in enforcing this agreement. And this, of course, is the top line number. This is what you see in Entertainment Weekly. This is what you see in the AV Club. And if you're not familiar with the concepts here, Basically, when you've got a contract, you don't have a provision like paragraph C, you've got a contract, you breach it, the side that is infringed upon or that was otherwise breached gets to go to court and say, hey, they breached their contract promises. These are the damages that accrued to me. I lost out on X, I lost out on Y, and they have to go show the court that this is the amount of money that that party that breached the contract should pay. In this case, they say, hey, look, we're talking about a comedy show. We're talking about someone stealing jokes or otherwise going out in the world, and in this case, saying negative things and opinions on Twitter, which is its own problem, believe me, and saying, hey, since we can't come up with the damage amount, we're just going to assume that it's $1 million. And as we talked about at the top of this video, in general, the United States court system is inclined to allow people freedom of contract, for you to look at this and say, yeah, okay, a million dollars, that's fine. And that's where you run into a lot of trouble right? I can tell you all about equitable principles right now. I can tell you that in general, liquidated damages are supposed to bear a reasonable nexus to what the actual damages would be. That if you go into this and then you actually do the analysis that they say would be so difficult and it's $990,000, then they are going to be okay with the liquidated damages provision, the court being the they in that sentence. But if you actually go through the process at the end of a court case and you realize that it's $10 that they were actually damaged or $0, then the court's going to throw out this liquidated damages provision. And right now, since there's nothing even remotely possible to base this $1 million penalty on, it looks egregious. It looks like what the court system would call a penalty, which are not allowed. Liquidated damages are supposed to be very difficult damages to calculate, but here's a number that's something close to what we think it would be. And we both agree that because we don't want to get into that calculation process, we don't want to waste all that time. We just all agree that it's $1 million. And look, Pete Davidson has a career. 
And maybe there's something that you could say online. Maybe there's a joke that you could steal that potentially costs him a significant amount of money. But at least on its face, $1 million seems like a ridiculous amount. And I think the court would think that it was a ridiculous amount at the start of a case. And then Mr. Davidson would have to show that it is a reasonable amount. That's what we talk about when we say equitable principles, that the court can look at this and say, nah, $1 million doesn't make sense. Strike that. We'll actually calculate damages or we'll reduce that to a number that makes sense. And we will eliminate subparagraph three. We'll eliminate most of paragraph A. And if you really want to enforce this, your case better fall under the contract as we rewrote it. That's the equitable power of a court in the United States. Now, that being said, you hear that all and you say, hey, the title of your video doesn't make sense, Rick. That all sounds like I shouldn't worry about this and I can sign it because it's all unenforceable. I will tell you that I talk to my clients about these kinds of things all the time. When you are negotiating a contract, the other side will put in unenforceable provisions. Your client may ask you to put in unenforceable provisions, primarily because, as I said at the start of this analysis, a lot of people are going to abide by them because they sign their name to something. And because they sign their name to something, regardless of its enforceability in the court of law, they want to honor that. And so there is still some power in including unenforceable provisions in a contract. The difficulty is, let's say you think it's all unenforceable. You don't mind signing it. You go and you see the show. You put something negative up on Twitter or wherever. Maybe the media contacts you and you don't just say no comment. And then Pete Davidson or Cowardly Dog Inc. sue you for a million dollars. You say, well, I watched this virtual legality episode and Rick told me it's probably all unenforceable to the extent that it's actually affecting me. And you might well be right. The issue is in order to get to that point, you have to have that trial. You have to go through that trial process, that litigation process. And ultimately that's where they get you, right? It's not the rap, it's the ride. And if Pete Davidson and Cowardly Dog can make sure that they defeat a summary judgment motion, which they might not, this is a ridiculous enough contract. But if they can, you're talking about real money, real expenditures. And on an equitable principle, you don't know whether the judge will just be the most freedom of contract judge in the history of mankind and say, look, you signed your name to it. That's it. That's the end of my analysis. That can happen. There are judges out there like that, just like there are judges out there which would cancel a contract, which I personally wouldn't have an issue with. You don't know what you are going to get in terms of a trial or a litigation setting until you go through the whole thing. And by that point, you've got litigator bills that are probably worth as much as what you might otherwise be exposed to, and you're not otherwise in a good position. So when I label my video, hey, you shouldn't sign it anyway, it's because this contract might be ridiculous. You might get this analysis from virtual legality, other lawyers on YouTube, EW, AV Club, whoever that's doing this story. But at the end of the day, you can't prevent yourself from going to court on this kind of thing. And it's going to cost something to get it kicked out, even if you can get it kicked out very early. And to my opinion, it's just not worth it, right? So let Pete Davidson have his ridiculous contract and let him have the suffering ticket sales that should accompany it. And let's move on from there. This has been Virtual Legality for today. If you like this, please like, please subscribe. We talk about these kinds of things in business and law, fun stories in pop culture, and also analysis of things like The Mandalorian and Kappa and YouTube and everything else. So please share it with your friends if you think they might be interested. Otherwise, if you saw this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it in its podcast form, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.